I feel like over the last like eight years, I've made millions and lost millions. Every single time what I come to realize is like the best tip is like just believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. So if you can't sit there and try to figure shit out yourself, it's just not going to work. And it's as simple as that, right? The idea of delegation and automation and AI, that all comes after you learn the necessary skill sets and the mindset because the mindset is truly the most important thing you need in order to succeed or generate any type of success in your life and uh that's what you have to ace first and it's the hardest thing to ace as simple as that and i even i suffer from it sometimes as well as i start new ventures and even in my old ventures we have access to all these amazing tools we have access to all these amazing software it's hard to not want to just start automating things and get your time back but if you don't get into the weeds and really learn the processes needed to succeed you are not going to be able to one articulate that to somebody who you're delegating the tasks to and to not be able to make educated decisions on what tools to use and what areas you should do this, this and that. And I know now like entrepreneurs like our age, everything's about speed and building the newest, coolest thing. So the fact that you are leveraging technology and being an online entrepreneur, but still understanding that you need to get in the weeds, try things, figure things out, I think is super important. Hey, welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I am your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, we are joined by Mo, the owner of Seed Phrase Daily, a crypto newsletter, and a ton of other amazing things. Mo, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, Andre. It's been a long time since we uh, played golf down here in Miami, so I'm excited to uh, run this conversation back, I guess, from the field and uh, see where else we could talk about. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to get to reconnect, and it's cool we get to do it in this way. I like to say at the beginning of most of my episodes, I've been fortunate at the beginning here to have some really cool people. So there's a small bit of selfishness in all these conversations where I get to uncover some really cool things. And then hopefully you all listening get to enjoy it too. Something that I always forget to do, if you're listening, like, follow, subscribe, help us out in any way. The algorithm loves your support. So kind of help us out in that way if you can. Again, thank you so much for coming on here. I'm really excited for people to get to hear kind of your story and your kind of journey as an entrepreneur. And the way I like to start, super basic, tell Tell everybody a little bit about you. I know I know about you, but tell everybody about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mo obviously is the name. I was born in Boston, immigrated back to Syria when I was about like six years old and then came back to America when I was like 14 years old. When I came back here, I had no clue what sushi was. We barely had access to the internet in Syria. And I pretty much didn't know what I was going to do with my life besides just kind of live the American life and kind of see where it figures out. Long story short, after high school, I went to college for a year, dropped out, started my first business or my first real business in America, I guess, you know, like end of high school. And from there, kind of the rest of my history, I like to say now the short story is like, I've built cool stuff before. Now I'm trying to build more cool stuff that'll make a little bit more money. So that's kind of the model right there. That's awesome. So what, what was that first business? Oof, so many businesses. My first real business actually was in high school. It was a clothing line, funny enough. I started a okay. clothing and it was called HMD, which standard for Highly Motivated Descendants. And it was a clothing line with this panda, a blonde, in a alcohol or a beer bottle. And I sold so many hoodies in my high school that they actually banned it because it had alcohol and drugs on it. And they said I was pretty much trying to influence people in a negative way. So they banned my first ever business of being worn within a high school facility. And then from there, I actually ended up starting another business, which was a completely different branding, but also a clothing line. But that's kind of like my first initial entrepreneur thoughts here, at least when I moved back to America. That is hilarious. And again, it's always a, no PR is bad PR. So did the sales go up when they started banning it? Did more people want to come and buy it? Like, how did that work? Yeah. So funny enough, when that when that happened, I sold probably like, when I say so much, I, it was probably like 400 hoodies, which I thought was a lot. No, sure. and that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I sold each hoodie for like 50, 60 bucks. I was like a 17 year old at the time, 16 year old. I was like, dude, I'm fucking rich as fuck. Like, yeah. we're out the projects. And yeah, so after like it got banned, I had two options. One is I kind of switch up the branding and the identity and kind of like reroute and try to reapproach the hoodie design. 
or what the school had suggested actually was to do the same design without the blind of bottle. And they were like, hey, maybe people would like that. Knowing me, I was like, screw that. And I already was like, they didn't really like the school as much. So I just made that an excuse to kind of tell my parents like, hey, I want to transfer schools because I was already traveling for like 40 minutes via like train and bus and bus stop and a school bus. And it was like a real hassle. So I ended up moving schools. I moved schools. I tried to push the same hoodie, it sold a little bit. And back then I didn't really know what I know now about e-commerce and obviously being like an online entrepreneur. But if I did, obviously, who knows where my life would be now. But yeah, I ended up transitioning to a new high school. I tried to sell the same hoodie, it didn't work. So I ended up catering like this new brand that I thought would fit to this new school that I was in, right? Because essentially I was like, okay, the school audience here or the audience demographic here is totally different. So let's try to like put a new spin on clothing here. And that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think the ability to identify product fit and that products don't work in certain environments or to a certain demographic or audience is great. And the fact that you're able to do that in high school shows that you definitely had your mind in the right place. And I'm not shocked at all that you turned out to be an entrepreneur with tons of businesses. You mentioned e-commerce, what you know now. I know that you have had some success in e-commerce. This is an area for me that is something I always heard about, something that was always close by to some of my earlier businesses, but something that I never dabbled in. So I'd love to kind of hear from your perspective. How was that journey? How'd you get into e-commerce? And maybe some fun facts that you could throw out to some of the viewers. Yeah, absolutely. So where did I start with e-commerce? So many times, so many trials and Error. And still until this day, honestly, it's still trial and error with e-commerce. I'm not the best guy out there, but I know obviously, you know, my capabilities, we scale brands pretty quickly. Let's see. One of my first business or after the whole high school career in terms of like doing clothing lines, I was a part of co-founding a door-to-door -door solar sales company. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I had to learn other skills besides obviously sales and communication, which was like marketing. Okay. How do, can we get more leads? How can we get in touch with more people? Because I didn't really love the idea of knocking doors every single day. Right. Yep. Even though I did it and I crushed it uh, for two years, but I had to learn more skills and marketing was one of them. And at the time it was like Facebook media buying. So knowing how to spend money on ads, Facebook, Instagram, and these other platforms back then, because TikTok wasn't really around. Yeah, it wasn't. It was fine back in the day. So that's how I kind of first dabbled into like the idea of spending money online and generating leads or revenue. And then from there, I pretty much parted ways with that solar ecosystem and that solar company because I just didn't enjoy it like I did. I felt like at the time I had extracted all the money that I wanted to extract out of it. Like at 18 years old, I was doing over $100,000 a year doing door to door sales. Like I would get $30,000 checks, $20,000 checks, just like commissions. And I was like, okay, like this is good. I want to do the next thing. Like I feel like I conquered this. And uh, that's how I got into e-commerce. I'm like, okay. So I went from commissions, which is like unlimited potential and unlimited like opportunity of being able to knock doors. But at the same time, it was like, you can only do so much with your time, right? Yep. So how do I kind of expand the idea of like being able to generate money? And uh, that's how I started dabbling into e-commerce and kind of figuring out how to start uh, online businesses. And funny enough, one of the first products that went viral for me, well, when I say viral, I, at least it started working and generating me money was just around the time Migos had dropped like culture, the first ever mm -hmm. one. And they were rocking like these gold shade glasses with the color lenses. And yep. I literally started a dropshipping store that sold those glasses and put some advertisement behind them. Like, hey, if you want to look like these rappers or you want to look like a superstar, these are the things to wear. And I ended up crushing that. And from there, obviously, it was just kind of the continuous process of like finding more products, building more websites, trying again and selling it until we kind of got to like building brands and so on and so forth. That's awesome. And what would you say is one of the biggest challenges for someone that wants to get into e-commerce? What were some things that you faced early on that you would tell yourself if you could go back and talk to yourself three, four years ago? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like over the last like eight years, I've made millions and lost millions. And, you know, every single time what I come to realize is like, there's the biggest thing, the biggest factor in anything you do, and like the, big, the best tip is like, just believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. So if you can't sit there and try to figure shit out yourself, it's just not going to work. And it's as simple as that, right? The idea of delegation and automation and AI, that all comes after you learn the necessary skill sets and the mindset. Because the mindset is truly the most important thing you need 
in order to succeed or generate any type of success in your life. And uh, that's what you have to ace first. And it's the hardest thing to ace as simple as that. That's great advice. And and I even I suffer from it sometimes as well as I start new ventures. And even in my old ventures, we have access to all these amazing tools. We have access to all these amazing software. It's hard to not want to just start automating things and get your time back. But if you don't get into the weeds and really learn the processes needed to succeed, you are not going to be able to one, articulate that to somebody who you're delegating the tasks to, and two, not be able to make educated decisions on what tools to use and what areas you should do this, this, and that. And I know now like entrepreneurs like our age, everything's about speed and building the newest, coolest thing. And it's funny, I had an episode before this today with an entrepreneur who started a landscaping company. And a funny thing that I've noticed on Twitter, people calling these things sweaty startups, startups that you actually have to get out there and do things. That's not cool right now for like our generation, but there's tons of money to be made. So the fact that you are leveraging technology and being an online entrepreneur, but still understanding that you need to get in the weeds needs, try things, figure things out, I think is super important. Yeah. And it's like the idea of like the shiny object syndrome, right? Because we live in a such a fast moving world. It's like, there's so many opportunities and we want to jump on all of them. But what I've realized, even like looking at my friends who are even more successful than me is it's funny because the people who stick to one thing for the longest time end up making the most out of it, right? Yeah. Like for me, obviously I, you know, I went to from e-commerce to crypto to back to e-commerce to like brick and mortar businesses to fashion to consulting. And I've made a good amount of money and I'm happy, not content, but happy obviously with the results. But I've also witnessed my friends who will have like, for example, built an agency and only focused on the agency for the last three, four, five years. Now they're getting the fruits of their labor, right? So it's like, whatever you can focus on and you can really enjoy for the longest time, that's going to be the thing that probably is going to pay you the most in one way, shape or form. Yeah. And I totally agree. And I definitely suffer from the shiny object syndrome. I'm just very curious naturally. So I love to go try and learn new things. If something gets just a little bit boring, I'm immediately like, all right, what's next? Like, what can I do next? And I agree. All the people around me who have been the most successful have been the ones that have found something that is really exciting for them, something they're really passionate about. And then they've done it consistently year after year. And I've been able to watch them be successful. So from that perspective, I totally agree with you. You mentioned crypto. Let's talk a little bit about that. I know you're really passionate about crypto, really hot topic still to this day. Maybe give a little intro on how you got into crypto, what you're excited about from the crypto perspective. And then we can kind of parlay that in a seed phrase and talk about that business. Yeah, absolutely. So I first knew about Bitcoin and Ethereum back in 2015 when I was knocking door to door. And nice. at the time, you know, my friend will lead, which is also the co-founder. He had told me about Bitcoin and Ethereum and I was like, cool, I'll throw some money at this thing. And uh, back then, like, obviously I probably bought Ethereum the first time when it was like $300 worth. And Bitcoin was at like 2000 and I bought, I made a little bit of money on that pump to like 10 K or 20 K. And then I kind of completely forgot about it. until the end of 2021, which we had just built a pretty big e-commerce business that ended up failing. And I wanted to do something else. And at the time, you know, just doing research, I was like, shit, crypto and NFTs look like it's the hot topic right now. Everybody's talking about this. So let me check it out. And one of the first things I noticed was like NBA top shot. So that's kind of yep. how I got into NFTs again. That's what attracted me. And then from there, I remember like watching like Squawk in the Box and CNBC and like seeing these headlines of like this shoe company sold like $7 million worth of NFTs online, which was Artifact. And from there, I was like, okay, shit, let me start dabbling into this space. So naturally, I just start looking for opportunity. I start trading. I start leverage trading, buying and selling NFTs, and I make a little bit of profit. Then I get to a point where it's like, mm, you know, I'd rather be the guy selling these instead of buying them in a sense and trying to like take take the little money, I guess. Yep. And, uh, so I ended up positioning myself, obviously, by growing Instagram and TikTok pages that pushed crypto and NFT content and positioning myself as like somebody who can help you market and sell out an NFT project. And because of that, and because of social media presence that I had and experience that I built from e-commerce, I was able to help consult in marketing multiple different NFT projects that ended up making me more money than I've ever made in my whole life. And long story short, not to keep rambling here, I guess, as the bull market started end to end, it was these pages that I had built on social media kind of stopped making 
the cash that they were supposed to make or that they were yep. making, right? So I'm like, okay, what do I do that's going to keep me involved in this space and obviously allow me to earn in some shape, way, or form? And I was like, screw it. Let's try to start this newsletter thing, right? I've never started a newsletter. And I don't know, honestly, it's been a good and bad decision at the same time, but we ended up starting Seed Phrase Daily. Well, it was first NFT All-Stars, we turned into Seed Phrase Daily, whatever, that's not important. And now we're trying to kind of approach it as like building the online community for the next bull run, right? Because that's like one of the biggest things we've seen as a gap, or I've seen as a gap during the last bull run. It's like, hey, every, all these influencers are just pushing, pushing, pushing content, but nobody's really like trying to build this new community or a specific place where they can curate content update people and show people tools, resources, et cetera. And that's how Seed Phrase Daily started originally. Awesome. So, I mean, newsletters are really hot right now. I know it's become extremely popular over the last couple of years. Everybody just seems to be getting the reading bug and wants to be more updated. As mainstream media becomes less and less credible, people are turning to individuals like yourself who can provide unbiased opinions and, and share what you're seeing at the ground level, which I think is one of the main issues and why I think individual media and things like Substack are going to be huge. A lot of the people reporting on the mainstream media side are so far removed from the ground where things are actually happening that some of their messages are just silly, like just so out of touch. And I think people are realizing that very fast. And people like yourself who are in the trenches, deep in the weeds, focusing on certain products, bringing amazing knowledge. I'm a subscriber of Seed Phrase Daily. I read it. I think it's awesome. So people like yourself that are doing this are positioning yourself for this next big boom. And I think that you're in a great place from that perspective, because I think there's only more adoption coming from the perspective of going to get individual media sources. Because I think that day and age of having your one or two like newspaper subscriptions or channels you watch is dead. Unfortunately, we have to work a little harder to educate ourselves on what's actually going on and finding people like yourself who have these amazing newsletters is going to be what people turn to. So I'd love to kind of hear from ground zero to now, like what it was like starting a newsletter, what you needed to do, what are some things like if somebody listening right now wanted to start a newsletter, what are some tips that you could throw at them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, we don't run a huge newsletter, it's 25,000 people and uh, it's not possible. Man. It's not a profitable business. So I'll That's leave it. still an amazing, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but it's still an amazing accomplishment. I mean, 2,500 or 25,000, did you say? 25,000 people reading your message is amazing. So I don't want you to downplay that. Kudos to you from that perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, of course it's cool. But um, I guess the answer to your question is like, the first thing I would let everybody know is like, don't do it for money because the money doesn't come until later. And I'm still yeah. waiting for that money to come in. <laughs> right, the reason why behind it is like any typical online business, for example, it's usually you sell the product and service upfront and then you get cash and then obviously you turn that cash into marketing money and you continue to do it again. With building a newsletter, you're investing your time, your resources in order to build a product, which is your community, right? And that's going to require a lot of time and a lot of resources to be able to get to a point where you can monetize it. And the way you monetize these newsletters, either you build your own product, you sell ads, for example, on your newsletter to your community or like any type of like affiliate deals. Like those are like the three main centers of building a newsletter. So in order of like tips to get started, knowing what I just mentioned, if that's what you want to sign up for, just be ready. And the value of like building a newsletter is you have a direct form of communication with whoever is on the other side of that newsletter. You don't have that on Instagram. You don't have that on social media. You don't have that anywhere else except email. That's why email is always going to be valuable because you're reaching yep. people directly where you want them to. And they're allowing you to reach them there in a friendly way. Reach them there in a friendly way. Yeah, I guess that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. And I do see eye to eye with you there. Like email is amazing. This individual allowed you to send them messages because they were interested in hearing what you had to say. And I think even in the bigger picture, communities are going to be huge. Even on my brain looking further out and maybe this a little bit tin hat-ish, I think companies are not going to have customer service departments anymore. They're just going to have curated communities where their amazing customers are going to be the customer service department. They're going to vouch for the business. They're going to help people out because that's what communities really build. So I think that that is becoming ever more important being able to like really develop a community within your following. And on one of my other podcasts, uh, Three's a Crowd, we had an episode where we talked through our consumer brands going to be dead in the next 20 years. And I actually think they will be. And I think that the creators are going to be the ones that take over, like the Kylie Jenners, the Paul Brothers, Mr. Beast, people like that who can create the demand for their products 
solely by posting and, and being themselves on social media are going to be the real winners. Because I mean, the amount of money you have to spend on marketing, the ability to just find the exact customer that you want, the ones that follow you, the ones that pay attention to you, the ones that care, those are going to be the individuals who can spin up brands with a snap of a finger. And I think more and more people will realize that and bigger brands will start to associate themselves with figures like you already see them doing. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but commercials now, I've, I don't think I've watched one commercial over the last two years that hasn't had a celebrity in it or somebody that is famous. And I think that speaks to brands really trying to associate themselves with individuals. So if you can master the community aspect of what you're building, you'll be able to drive so much value to people who want to partner with you, to yourself from a product perspective, so I think what you're doing is amazing. And I think it's really awesome that you're really narrowed in on this community and that you've stuck it out because it has been a little rocky for crypto and all that and NFTs from the time where things were flying. I mean, you could make $100,000 on accident to now when it's like you could lose $100,000 really easily or you need to be very careful. So again, kudos to you for building this up. 25,000 people is a huge accomplishment. And I think it's just overall like just an amazing thing that you've built because it really is a great product. Like I, I read it, I look at it. If you guys are listening, Seed Phrase Daily, go sign up for the newsletter. It is awesome if you want to keep up with what's going on with cryptos and NFT. Maybe it's a good time to ask you, let's kind of remove ourselves from all the businesses individually. Just as an entrepreneur yourself, entrepreneur to entrepreneur, what can you tell people listening advice-wise on how to be a better entrepreneur, how to be a better person, how to continue to grow and, and kind of keep that brain turning? Good question. I would say the first thing that comes to mind is like, it's a lot easier to lose everything than it is to make what you want. And I'll put yep. that into perspective for you. Making, let's say your first $100,000 is technically pretty easy right? You find a product or service that you can sell 10 people for $10,000, right? Or 20 people for $5,000 or 50 people for $2,000, right? But once you have the $100,000, let's say, it's actually a lot harder to keep it than it is to generate it because you feel one, like the, the euphoria, obviously the ego, the opportunity, the status that comes with having, let's say that type of money can really play with your head and say, Hey, I'm rich. I'm on top of the world. So let me start spending. And then you end up going back to the point where you started. Right. And I think every entrepreneur that I've met with and like friends that have made a lot of money and lost it, or at least spent it, not necessarily lost it. will definitely relate to this because again, once you learn the skill sets to make the money, obviously you can continue to make it time and time again, but the skill sets to keep maintain and grow the money is actually a lot harder than it is to make it. So I would say that's like one of the biggest lessons I've learned for sure. Dude, I think that's spot on. And I mean, I, I can speak personally, like that happened to me. <laughs> I had three amazing businesses all in the same niche, all building on top of each other. I'm 20, 21 years old and money is just coming in left and right. And I think I'm on top of the world. And then this thing called COVID shows up and then the supply chain shows up and all of this amazing business that I built kind of crumbled and I was spending money because I thought I was living life. Like I wasn't ready for that to happen. And again, like you said, it was honestly pretty easy for me to build this and build up the wealth, but it was so easy for me to lose it too. So what you said there, like for anybody listening, like that personally happened to me, that is something that happens to a lot of people. And like you said, the hardest part is not making it, it's keeping it and being able to use that money to keep building. Yeah. You can compare that to like relationships and girls, right? Like it's very easy for any average guy to come out in Miami for, or any state and go and bag a girl and you know, be able to smash her for one night, but it's a lot harder to keep that girl and tell her to continue to coming back and hang out with you and want to be a part of your life. And business and money and entrepreneurship is the same exact thing. It's a very easy to make the money, but it's a lot harder to keep it and have a relationship with it that it's going to continue to want to grow with you as you grow. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think this has been amazing. Like if you're still here, there's so many nuggets of information that you could take away from this conversation, whether it's e-commerce based things, NFT and crypto based things, or just in general, being a good entrepreneur, a great minded individual. Something I like to do at the end to kind of slow things down and move away from the business related conversation. I ask a very simple question and you can answer it however you want. There's no right or wrong answer. And the question is, what is something that you're excited about in the near future? It's a good question. I mean, I'm excited about a lot of things. What am I excited about? 
in the near future that I, is worth talking about here. Honestly, I'm just excited to see where the world ends up. Like, I feel like the, the world has moved so fast over the last six months specifically that it's really just very exciting to see what the next six months are going to look for because you've never been so uncertain and certain at the same time like anybody our age or even younger is going through like all these the biggest technological and mindset and like access changes we've ever witnessed no other generation has seen crypto nfts ai covid money printers all come in at the same time within a two-year period and still not know what's next and I think that the idea of like what is going to come next is pretty exciting because it's like what else is going to surprise us this year? Aliens? Like that's not even a far fetched shock. So I would say that that's what I'm excited about. Just the future in general. We'll see what else is going to come over the next six to months, two years. Yeah. So I think what you said there is amazing. That's a super interesting answer. Um, it's funny. I, I get so many different answers. Like some people say, "Oh, I'm excited about." that I'm going to eat my favorite at my favorite restaurant tonight. And then there's people like yourself that, Hey, I'm just excited for what the hell is going to happen in the next six months, because I'm like yourself, very in tune with everything financially and the big picture going on. And I am very curious and interested to see what's going to happen. So again, great answer. I want to make sure people can follow you, connect with you. So no shame plugging things here, plug anything you want. And then let's say any social media handle that you want. For anybody listening, all of Mo's information is going to be in the description anyways. But for the people who are super lazy and don't want to read shit, maybe read out one or two of your social medias where you're pretty active on. Yeah, of course. I would say I'm most active currently on Twitter. So if you want to follow me on Twitter at the Mo Hayek. I'm sure it'll be in the description below, but that's the tag there. And if you want to stay updated with uh, crypto, a little bit of AI and NFTs, then make sure you check out our podcast and newsletter at Seed Phrase Daily. Awesome. Thank you again, Mo. It was a pleasure having you on. Anybody that made it this far, this was an amazing episode with so many good nuggets of information. So make sure that you go through and connect with Mo. And if you haven't already, follow, like, subscribe to the podcast. We're building something amazing here at Virtual Ventures. Mo's building something amazing over at Seed Phrase Daily. So appreciate you coming on and it was a pleasure happy to be here bro thank you so much best of luck yep. to you.